slowly orbiting at the edge of deep space, 1,000 kilometers beyond 21st century Earth, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Starlab. Here, Starlab Research Director Maura Cassidy and scientists and technicians of the International Space Authority watch over the countless star systems that fill the universe. This week, Maura Cassidy and space exploration team captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff encounter the phantoms of Tamerlane and experience a dream within a dream on Alien Worlds. This is Star Lab. I read you, Galileo. What's your situation, Captain Egan? Where are you? We're 200 kilometers out at Vector 205. And this isn't Captain Egan. It's Lieutenant Becker. Egan's dead. Lieutenant Becker, this is Dr. Cassidy. What happened to Captain Egan? He died in the maelstrom, Dr. Cassidy. A whirlpool in the universe. Captain Egan fell into it and in the stars. He's either tripped out on something or he's in shock. Uh, Lieutenant Becker, what's the condition of your crew? Sleeping. They fell asleep on camera lane. They're still dreaming. Call the short-range vehicle hangar, Jerry, and order a couple of tugs out to tow them in. Right. And all my days are trances, and all my nightly dreams are where thy dark eye glances, and where thy footstep gleams. Attention all SRV personnel. This is a priority rescue alert. Prepare three Magnum class tugs for immediate launch. Utility pilots Haskell, Shaw, and Henning. Please report to the SRV operations officer. Leader, Vector 9. Mission control, Galaxy 9. Uh, Roger, Star Lab. We have the Galileo inside and she is damaged. Uh, looks like the starboard thruster housing's ripped open and she's leaking fuel. Tug 17. Uh, 17, go ahead, Lee. Uh, yeah, Jamie, see if you can check out that fuel leak, will you? Uh, Roger. Uh, tug 9. Tug 9. Come on, Ron, I know you're there. I can hear you swearing at your receiver in my headphones. <laughs> Sorry about that, Lee. I had to switch to another channel. Your transmission was uh, breaking up. Okay. Get around to the Galileo's port side and uh, see if you can get a grapper pad on her. Use the standard placement. Roger. I have grappler contact, Lee. Bad magnetism stable. Okay, Lee, I've closed off the leak. All right. Now let's get a grappler pad on her starboard side. I'll stick one on the nose. Roger. Okay, you guys, let's haul her in. Five minutes after launch, Space Tugs 2, 9, and 17 return to Starlab with a damaged laboratory ship in tow and guided into docking bay 14. After the Galileo's arrival, Starlab's executive physician, Dr. Diana Rossiter, begins a computer-assisted examination of the ship's unconscious crew. Three hours later, Starlab's Mycroft computer completes its analysis of the examination. Look at the waveform patterns here on screen three. Hmm. 
These are the electroencephalograms of the Galileo's crew. You notice anything unusual? It looks like the same EEG repeated ten times. That's right. And not only are their EEGs identical, they all have the same pulse rate, temperature, respiration, and dream state eye rhythms. Really? I don't know what happened to them, Maura. But they're all dreaming the same dream. Six weeks after its disappearance during a routine mission, the deep space laboratory ship Galileo returns to Star Lab, its captain missing and presumed dead, its first officer in a state of second degree mind shock its crew asleep and dreaming identical dreams. What about Lieutenant Becker? He talked off and on during his examination, but he was getting so anxious, I, I thought it best to sedate him for a while. Diane, did you record what he said during the examination? Mm. Maddie's making a copy of the tape now. You want to hear it? Mm-hmm. Have her send it up to my quarters. I'll listen to it when John and Buddy get here. Solaris to Star Lab Control. This is Star Lab. Go ahead, Solaris. We've picked up some time, Jerry. Our revised ETA is 4 minutes, 13 seconds. 4 plus 13, roger. Okay, John, your revised docking orbit insertion coordinates are 196 degrees at subvector 20 alpha, docking bay 9. See you in a few minutes, Jerry. Solaris out. Star Lab clear on ITS channel 096. You have that look on your face, buddy. What are you thinking? Remember what Maura said about Lieutenant Becker? You know, that verse he quoted when she asked what happened to Frank? Yeah, what about it? Well, it's part of a poem by Thackeray or Tennyson, one of those guys. It's from that period, anyway. I know I've either heard it or read it. Wait a minute. Ingrid. Ingrid read it to me. Solaris to Star Lab Control. Uh, this is Star Lab. Stand by. Go ahead, Solaris. Uh, Jerry, patch me through to the library. I have to talk to Ingrid. Roger. Stand by. And all my days are trances, and all my nightly dreams are where thy dark eye glances and where thy footstep gleams in what ethereal dances by what eternal streams oh, that's it what's it from ingrid it's the last verse of a poem called to one in paradise by edgar Allan poe and that isn't lieutenant becker's only reference to poe uh, buddy play back the last part of dr rossiter's tape again okay mentioned coincides with one of Poe's short stories, A Descent into the Maelstrom. And the reference to Grains of Golden Sand? A poem Poe wrote in 1847 after his wife died, A Dream Within a Dream. Maura. What is it, Jerry? Uh, you better get up here. I have a transmission coming through on the Mayday frequency. It's Captain Egan. Egan? What? How can that be? We're on our way, Jerry.
I'm on Tamerlane, somewhere in the Earth's minor system. The exact coordinates are on the Galileo's flight recorder. What about the whirlpool, Captain? An illusion, a dream, <laughs> like everything else around here. What's your situation now, Frank? Now, the batteries here in the crawler are about gone, so this will have to be my last transmission. And I have rations for two, maybe three days. Get me out of here, buddy. I don't, I don't think I can... Captain Egan? Captain Egan? Ah, that's it. We've lost him. Ingrid, is Tamerlane connected to Poe? It's one of his most famous poems. What's it about? Love, life death, rebirth, the entire spectrum of physical and mystical experience. Call Docking Bay 14, Jerry. Tell Simon to disconnect the Galileo's flight recorder and take it to the Solaris. Okay. Ingrid, go back to the library and pull everything you have on Edgar Allan Poe. Hard copy, sleep tapes, microcards, everything. Then meet us at the Solaris. Am I going with you? You certainly are. But why? Because what happened to the Galileo might happen to us. And since this whole incident is somehow connected to Poe... What you know about his work might be our only protection. Okay, let's get busy. At 1330 hours, 40 minutes after receiving Captain Egan's transmission, Maura and Ingrid enter Docking Bay 9 and join John and Buddy aboard the Solaris. Is everything programmed and ready? Oh, we're all set, Mara. Good. Better strap yourselves in. We're due to launch in 90 seconds. Ready? Let's yeah. go. Okay, buddy, let's run it down. Exterior hatches and fuel bay doors. Pressurized and locked. Environmental control systems. Green across the board. ECS backup terminals. In phase and programmed for zero time emergency interlock. Microwave antenna function. Positive. Digital auto guidance and inertial gyro integration. Auto guidance in phase. Gyro integration at zero minus three seconds. Tank pressure. Maximum one through six. Cancel the ignition safety terminal. Positive function on IST lockout. Star Lab, the Solaris penetrates the Ursa Minor star system, a constellation filled with glowing stellar dust and brilliant star clusters, a constellation dominated by the second magnitude binary star, Polaris. Three hours later, guided by the navigation coordinates from the Galileo's flight recorder, the sleek white SET interceptor lands on a dark, mist-shrouded planetoid of Tamerlane. Open the visual scanner ports, buddy. Let's have a look at this place. Okay. There's nothing but mist and shadows. Can you move a little to the right, buddy? I can't see the screen from back here. Oh, yeah, sorry. How's that? That's fine. Looks like the landscape in the fall of the House of Usher. Wait a minute. What's that in the corner of the screen? It's a cat. Yeah. A black cat. It's... Wait a minute. What happened? Where'd it go? It's gone. Was it really there? It's gone. Maybe it wasn't really there. It had to be there. Oh, buddy, I'm so sleepy. We all saw it, didn't we? Where's Frank? Oh, we have to find Frank. Go to sleep. Don't go to sleep. We can't go to sleep. Don't go to sleep. Hear the tolling of the bells. Iron bells. What a world of solemn thought their melody compels. Hear the loud alarm bells, brazen bells. 
What a tale of terror now that turbulency tells. In there, Fortunato. The cask of Amontillado is in there. I forced the last stone into position and plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re erected the old rampart of bones. For half a century, no mortal has disturbed them. in peace, Fortunato. Requiscat in pace. Under the floor. He's hidden the old man's body under the floor. Louder. 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 I admit it. I admit it. Tear up the blanks. Stop the beating of his hideous heart. vibration of the pendulum was at right angles to my length. It slowly descended, hissing back and forth, repeating its arc again and again. Shades of evening drew on, within view of the melancholy house of Usher. And the river, ever flitting, still in sitting, still in sitting. On the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door, and his eyes have all the seeing of the demons that is dreaming. How shall the burial rite be read? The solemn song be sung. The requiem for the loveliest dead that ever died so young. All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. Dream within a dream. Dr. Cassidy. Within a dream. Buddy. Within a dream. John. Within a dream. Buddy. John, within wake up. Dream. Dr. Cassidy, wake up. Oh. Frank. I saw you land about an hour ago. I've been trying to raise you on the Crawler Short Range Transmitter ever since. Bell. I was dreaming about bells and some kind of terrible razor swinging back and forth. And there was a murder. An old man was killed. His body was under a floor, but his heart wouldn't stop beating. The pit and the pendulum. The telltale heart. Poe. We've all been dreaming about his stories and poems. Everyone aboard the Galileo had the same dreams. After we landed here to repair the meteorite damage, we saw a black cat. And when it ran into the mist, we all fell asleep. But you weren't asleep the whole time you were here. What woke you up? Earth tremors and storms. And after every disturbance, the mist would clear long enough for us to see another part of Tamerlane had disappeared. It's, it's losing its molecular density, too. I've been checking it out on the crawler's densiometer. Tamerlane is returning to its own dimension. What do you mean? Tamerlane isn't supposed to be in this time-space continuum. Somehow or other, it slipped out of its own dimension. And now, it's slipping back. How do you know that? The longer you stay here, the more you dream. And with every dream, you understand a little bit more about Tamerlane and what it is. Have you found out why all the dreams are related to Edgar Allan Poe? Yes, I have. I found the house last night. House? What house? The house where the dream chamber is. The house of Usher. Come on, I'll show you. The house of Usher. It's just the way I imagined it. Looks haunted to me. Tamerlane drops out from under us. Take my hand, buddy. We're 
too, Frank. Up the stairs, then turn left. It's freezing in here. Help me with the door, John. It's impossible. It's not a room at all. Space. Oh, it's beautiful. We're in space. The dream chamber. An opening in a time-space continuum. A place enclosed not by walls, but by the golden light and phantom shadows of a parallel universe. A void filled with glittering star fields and an eternity of stellar mists tinted with all the colors of creation. And in the center of the dream chamber, a bed made of interlocking beams of light, and lying on the bed, forever asleep and forever dreaming. It's him. It's Paul. Is he alive? He's a dream, buddy. A dream sustained by everyone who reads his work and falls in love with its beauty and terror, its sorrow, its truth. Well, we're looking at Poe's eternity. It's fading. Everything's fading. Let's get back to the ship before we get caught in this. Look, he's standing up. Ingrid, what's wrong with you? He's not standing up. He's, he's still... away. He's running away. Ingrid. Buddy, help me. I can't heal anything. Hey, help me with her, Frank. Okay, okay, let's get her out of there. from Dr. Rossiter. Lieutenant Becker's all right, and so is the Galileo's crew. They woke up about a half an hour ago. All right, Commissioner. Thank you. See you tomorrow. ISA comm center clear. Half hour ago. That means they woke up the instant Tamerlane disappeared. What are you doing, Ingrid? The hallucination I had in the dream chamber and that terrible stillness afterwards. I know it's related to one of Poe's stories. I remember something... I remember. Here it is. Silence. Silence. A, a fable. fable. And mine Silence. eyes fell upon the countenance of the man. Superman. And he was afraid. And he was afraid. He raised his head and listened. He raised his head and listened. But there was no voice throughout the vast, Silence. illimitable void. Illimitable void. Only Silence. Only Silence. And, and the man, man turned his face away, away and fled into the distance. And I beheld him. Within a Dream was written by Ron Thompson and starred Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Philip Miller, Corey Burton, and the Watermark Players, with special guest stars Francis Bay, Clark Warren, Mel Wells, Jack Angel, and Marilyn Schreffler. Associate producer Ron Thompson, music director Tom Rowan, engineer Stu Jacobs, technical consultant Peter Skye. Assistant to the producer, Jim Cook. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen. And so, until next week, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us for the adventure of the Parallax Deception from the elsewhere and elsewhen of Alien Worlds.